Welcome to the next one in my Coffee Chats with Investment Platform series. And um, this one is with Nutmeg, who most of us have heard of, really well-known brand. And I speak to Kate Munn, who is an investment and savings specialist and the head of PR. Um, and it was a really great chat. I think you'll enjoy it. So why should people start investing? Why should they even consider it? And, you know, if they've only got 50 quid or less to invest each month is it still worth doing yeah so I think um this is something that I get asked a lot I think particularly from sort of friends and family actually as well as as everybody else um now that particularly at the moment cash saving rates are really really low um I have a small cash account it holds money that I might need in the immediate term if my boiler breaks or the car needs a service but beyond that once I've got enough covered for what I like to think of sort of three to five months worth of spending and bills then it's a little time to invest and the returns can be better if you're willing to sort of lock your money away for a little while and the question you ask around how much and sort of on a monthly basis I actually think there's two things there that I'd really like to talk about one is you don't need massive amounts to invest I think that's a little bit of a misconception you know we always talk to people who have built up quite a savings pot in cash unaware that you could start from maybe as little as a hundred pounds um, and in terms of making regular contributions, actually, it's a really good idea to put a little bit away each month. It gets you into a really good savings habit and investing habit. You can also benefit from um, putting your money into the market at different times. The jargon, uh, which I try to try to avoid, uh, is called pound cost averaging. But it basically means you're sort of buying in 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 the market volatility time. So sometimes it'll be up and sometimes it'll be down and you can help smooth out that investment journey. Right. So you just touched on it briefly there, but it would be good to hear your view on like the returns. Um, a big misconception is that sustainable impact ESG types of investments don't actually offer as good returns as other types of investments. So is that what you're seeing or, you know, what would what's your usual answer to that? So it's definitely something we get a lot. And I think initially and early on in a sort of ethical green, as you say, impact in investment life, there was that view that I'm doing good with my money. So I'm, I'm willing to sort of earn a little bit less in terms of return. And actually, we look at our investment portfolios, our socially responsible portfolios, they launched in 2018, and they've delivered better returns than their non- um, socially responsible focus counterparts when we look at the industry and that time period is interesting because there was times when the markets were having quite a strong time and there was a view that oh but socially responsible portfolios they might not perform so well when there's a market downturn and then obviously last year where the markets had a more difficult year particularly sort of around end of February March actually our socially responsible portfolios lost a bit less and then recovered better if that makes sense so the view that if you want to invest in line with your values and in a socially responsible way means you have to sacrifice um your returns just doesn't add up when you look at the numbers amazing so how do you measure positive impact what, what makes those funds socially responsible so when we launched ours, we teamed up with MSCI, who are a world leader in analytics across environmental, social and governance scores. And we score, actually, we score all of our portfolios. So yes, our socially responsible portfolios have scoring factors, but so do our non-socially responsible um, portfolios. So you can see what your investment is doing for you, but also for the planet. Um, we look at different factors. So for example, in the environmental, we look at carbon emissions and CO2 emissions, as you would probably expect. We also look at water stress and what impact that could have. There's social and governance as well, which are some of the criteria that I think particularly has come front of mind in probably the last 12 to 18 months of people have started to think, are the businesses that I'm investing in treating their workforce well? What's their policy on data privacy? Um, and, you know, what's their kind of good governance like? Do they pay their staff well? Do they look after their staff? I think all of these things are things that we as people have started to think about a little bit more in the last sort of 12 to 18 months. It's also important to think about how important are those factors for that business. So, for example, CO2 emissions and carbon is considerably different impact if you're a business that does 
if you're an airline, as an example, that's a much bigger factor in much the same way that I want to know that uh, Facebook or Twitter or Amazon are how are they treating my data because they data privacy is a much bigger thing. So there is an up weighting that's sector specific. So you know that, you know, you're getting a good view of how those companies perform compared to their peers. Mm, OK, great. And there is a lot of greenwash out there so a lot of investors are confused by all of these terms and all of these different fund strategies um, and even funds that are labeled with similar names whether it's sustainable or an impact fund the, the quality of those funds differ some just aren't as good as others so what would your top tips be for somebody who is trying to cut through that greenwash and, and really find out what their impact is I, I think the first thing is know or have a bit of an idea of what's important for you. So what's important for you might be very different to what's important for me. We actually did some research with investors last year to look at what are those factors that really trigger for you. Now, social uh, com companies that scored well from a social perspective scored much more important for most people than um, environmental factors. Now, that could have been a sign of the times because no one was going anywhere. Um, but knowing what you want is a good start starting point and then have a look at those funds now before you invest they should be able to tell you are they screening things out are they screening out certain industries or certain types of businesses and also are they rewarding or investing in businesses that show best practice so for example there is you know a school of thought from an investment philosophy perspective that simply withdrawing money completely doesn't necessarily help if you then have a business that's also um, leading the way in terms of it might be an energy provider that's really leading the way in terms of green energy and alternative energy then you may also want to look at what that looks like so at nutmeg we have a socially responsible investment philosophy document you can download it you can see exactly what we screen in and what we sort of screen out if you like um, and ask questions i think there is a fear i don't know whether it's an innately british thing that everyone's too afraid to say oh i can't possibly ask questions you absolutely can these businesses will have social media channels where you can talk to them or customer support teams do ask the questions if you can't find the information yeah that's such a good point i think people have started to forget how to just pick up the phone and speak to it <laughs> you know i mean yeah. i'm you know i i'm the same you know i if it's not on somebody's website then the information doesn't exist to me yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah it's really important that people do ask those questions but the more that's available on websites the better yeah. um and how about holdings do you provide a list of all your holdings to your customers who ask for it or is it available on your website so um, if you're invested, if you're a Nutmeg customer, um, either through your app or through the dashboard, if you log in via a laptop, you can see all of your asset allocation, you can see your ETF holdings. You can also, if you would like, uh, contact our customer support team and you can even have the underlying holdings within each of those um, ETFs. And that's the, the reason. Company. Yeah, well, that is, and it's, yeah, it's exactly, and it's that base level company. So yeah. an average portfolio may have somewhere between seven and eight and a half thousand, depending underlying holdings, which is why it's not currently um, on the app or in the dashboard, because we haven't figured out exactly a way to make it not look like a spreadsheet. Yeah, okay. Um, and another way that people um, can have a bit more control over their impact and through their money is to, when they are invested, is to use their shareholder rights and actually vote on shareholder resolutions at AGMs. And there are a couple of platforms that are making that easier to do. Um, what do you think of that idea is that where you're seeing things going? Do you get a lot of questions from your customers around specific companies and their behaviours? Um, yeah, just a bit more about ownership and voting and the retail investor would be good to hear. Yeah, so I think the sort of view of stewardship um, is a really interesting one. I think traditionally particularly from an active management perspective there's maybe a thought that you could be more involved from a stewardship perspective but uh, for example um 
BlackRock, who you may have seen last year, their CEO uh, came out, Larry Fink came out with a big statement around how they were really just starting to drive their sustainability um, criteria across their portfolios. And they are a huge, if not the largest sort of passive investment house. I do think it's a good question and I do think it's something to be mindful of. Again, that should be in some of the documents that you get. You know, you should be able to access how are these businesses voting on particular issues. And I do know that kind of in the sector, there is a, an increase and there's much more attention into how they can make that more easily accessible. Um, it's not sort of hidden behind uh, closed doors. So there is an, an impetus to try and make that um, more visible to a, a retail investor. I would also sort of guess my, um, what's my, my, my kind of word of warning might be a, uh, don't let the sort of perfect become the enemy of the good. So you kind of, you'll get some, there's progress and that progress is really, really um, positive to see from a stewardship perspective. And the industry is definitely moving in the right way. Yeah, no, that's fair. Um, and then just a question on investor diversity. This is something really important to me, seeing more women invest, more yep. people of colour um, and people on lower incomes. Um, what are you seeing in terms of your customer base? Is the, the demographic changing as this type of investment becomes more popular and investment platforms themselves become more popular? Um, and are you doing anything to try and help increase the diversity of your customer base? So um, it's a question I'm really pleased you've asked because I am also banging that drum very loudly. <laughs> I think that investing should be more accessible to more people. Um, and I, I think there's a shift. Last year, actually, we saw an acceleration. One in five new investors with Nutmeg last year was uh, female. Um, at a time when I think fewer than one in 10 women have a stocks and shares ISA. So we are starting to see them think, OK, this is now, this is something for me. I think partly an industry that has traditionally as you said at the start really loved jargon and complexity has not necessarily put people off it just seems quite exclusive and closed I do think that everyone is sort of seeing the benefits of being a little bit more open um, and seeing more people you see that people like you invest um, it's not something culturally here we really talk about I've got friends who are American and actually they talk about investing much more just mm. in their social groups um, and I think as we move towards that hopefully we'll see that diversity come as well as still seeing actually you guys have customers who look and who are very much like me that's we need to see more of that. And I think social media could have a really positive impact in that sense. We're seeing more people talking about their sort of investment successes. You know, I've invested and in, now I'm buying a house or that sort of thing, which will really help bring that to life as well. Yeah, amazing. And I've actually only got one more question for you now. So at, cool. what point, <laughs> at what point should somebody speak to a financial advisor? When should they go and pay for that professional advice? So financial advice, I think, comes when your needs might become a little bit more complex. So potentially if you've inherited a larger sum or um, equally, I suppose you might be getting to that stage where you've got children of your own or you're thinking about how do I start to look at what I might be leaving, then might be a good time to uh, see a financial advisor. I also think as well, there are different um, types of advice. So you could get one off financial advice. So you could have maybe had a, a windfall or an inheritance and had a large sum of cash and said, actually, now's a really good time to take stock and have a look at what my financial picture looks like. And an advisor could be brilliant there. But you don't necessarily require that ongoing advice because your situation might not change. And then there is that if you need it on an ongoing basis, that's where you kind of weigh up the value of either a one-off around a big life event or ongoing because you've got more complex needs. Yeah, no, that's great. I am going to ask you actually one more bonus question. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'd, I'd be interested to know how things have changed because of the pandemic. You know, what do savings look like? More people saving or is it less? How have things changed for Nutmeg? So there has very much been, and I mean, it's something we've seen. I think it's also something we've seen from some of the industry figures. Last year, there was very much, and I think it will go into the first half of this year, 
two groups of people, those who unfortunately may have been furloughed or may have um, sort of lost a job or then needed to call on savings and investments that they had built up to get them through. Um, but then we also had a group of people who were very fortunate and in a fortunate position where their income had stayed the same and actually their outgoings all disappeared. You know, they may not have a season ticket or the cost of commuting to work. They weren't going on holiday. Sadly, we weren't even going out or going to the gym. So that became a case of actually we've now got additional money. I know the Bank of England did some research um, towards the end of last year that looked at the 108 billion accidental savings, they called it, as a result of last year across the UK. Um, and then from an investing perspective, I think the combination of having this additional pot and also cash savings rates and interest rates being really low encourage people to say, actually, now's the time for me to start investing. So we had seen really rapid growth um, beyond what we were sort of expecting for the year. And it's always hard in an uncertain market to know where you're going. And actually, the markets had a difficult time February, March, but by the end of the year, portfolios were all in positive territory. So it's a case of if you can ride it out for a longer term, that's really, really beneficial. Yeah. Well, look, thank you so much for joining me today. And um, I'm going to leave all your information in the description of this video so people can go and find you and learn more about what you've got to offer. Perfect. Brilliant. Thanks very much for having me. Thanks.